Hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. These interviews are available on YouTube or as a podcast, so please find the links in the description. Today's special guest is Dr. Robin Underwood. Robin is a doctor of entomology and serves as the extension educator in apiculture at Penn State. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. Here's Dr. Underwood. Hi, I'm Robin Underwood, and I am the Penn State Extension Educator of Apiculture. Uh, I service the whole state, but I live in the eastern part in Berks County. And what, what state are we talking about? Pennsylvania. Oh, the state of knowing about bees. So, okay, so thank you, Robin. I want to thank you for being here and for responding to my invitation to interview because there's so many things we want to know, and I think you're the person to talk to. And I was so excited to meet you down at the West Virginia Conference, Honey in the Hills, where, by the way, you gave a really good presentation, and I have uh, questions even related to that. But uh, so just thanks a lot for being here. And what does the extension office do? In other words, how did you end up there? And what does kind of your day-to-day look like? Uh, extension to me is taking research from you know the academics and bringing it to the people that need the information. So that would be, in our case, the beekeepers. Um, I have been doing honeybee research for a really long time. And I've always been really interested in what I call applied research. Mm -hmm. So I am a very, I'm the beekeepers beekeeper. You know, I do things that are practical that -hmm. are immediately relevant to beekeepers. Even when I talk about it, they already can tell that um, they could or could not change their beekeeping practices based on what I study. Others in academia, you know, maybe studying something very specific, something that requires a lab or, you know, viral testing or all those really important things. Mm -hmm. But a beekeeper can't do that themselves, you know. So that's not the type of stuff that I enjoy doing. I do, however, have partners that do that, right? I get myself on a really great team so I can improve my research impact. Um, But I'm really interested in practical things with beekeeping. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of like uh, you're the boots on the ground type of uh, education. I am. I never just want to be sitting in my office or be in the lab with the white coat. I want to be out there getting stung, sweating, swearing, and lifting heavy boxes, you, just like everybody else. Swe- swearing, getting stung, what? <laughs> lifting heavy. And we should also mention uh, the picture behind you there, and mm-hmm. you said that's Charlie Vorsich's, uh those are his bees. When was that taken? Um, that would have been spring 2021. Uh, we did a project where we asked beekeepers to uh, have an apiary of 20 colonies, and we gave them four each of five lines of queens, and oh, they yeah. had to requeen those colonies. And so this was Charlie's contribution to that research. We call it the CARE project because the funding came from something with the acronym C-A-R-E, but which the, I can't remember at the moment. The meaning of the acronym escapes you right now? It That's does. okay. I have a question about the highest stack there with the the deep yellow ones, the yellow ochre or whatever. Are those full of honey? What's going on there? Yeah, this was in May, and I'm guessing, I think some were full, and then some were soon to be full. Yeah. Just So some of those were hope chests? They were just hoping that they would eventually fill up. Because, I mean, I don't even and know how did. to reach up and attend a, a hive. Like, how do you get the top boxes off? Well, you know, Charlie, he's pretty tall. I do have a picture of him on a ladder Okay. to get to the top. He climbs a ladder. So, he doesn't wear, like, those those drywall stilts that guys wear, and they can walk around and do stuff. So well, I you know, he did have his knees replaced, so I wouldn't recommend. Okay, so drywall stilts are out for Charlie. Okay. And I should mention that he's, I'm in the same beekeepers association of Charlie. So we're friends. In fact, I met Charlie back in 2007. He's the reason I joined the Northwest PA beekeepers. He was at the Waterford fair. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. And his wife made me taste honey. It's a very scary experience. 
Okay, so huh. moving on. I have a question about, this is something that people really want to know, and a lot of my viewers are backyard beekeepers. Um, so when we see a stack of hives like that, one of the questions uh, people may want to know is, do I have to wait and let, like, do we keep supering, or could we, once a box is full and everything's capped and ready to go, couldn't we just pull that one off and put a new one on? Or do we have to continue to build a, a really tall stack of uh, supers like that? Um, as a hobbyist, I would absolutely recommend take it off, extract it, and put it back. Um, mm -hmm. It would be a really fun exercise in seeing how the honey changes over time, too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you keep them separate by month or whatever, that would be really great. Um, this is like the lazy man's let's wait until the end kind of supering. Okay, um, so Charlie's but... lazy. Okay. <laughs> Busy, so, busy, busy man's. Yeah, because for I commercial do. people, they do these things seasonally and they get all their equipment out. And of course, the honey house fires up and everything else. So it's for expediency. And when backyard beekeepers get something like that, I think I, I like what you just said, that they should probably pull it as they go. And there's nothing wrong with dating the box. So you kind of know the spring nectar flow. What's your big nectar flow right now where you're at? Well, there's lots of clover um that's a good question there's a lot of green i don't really see that i th this is a weakness of mine i don't really follow the plants okay uh, so you, you hate plants cut this part okay. out <laughs> all right hate plants. all right so but do you wait do <laughs> I you don't keep, hate them <laughs> that's my dry wit so listen um do you do you keep bees your yourself on your own property or or is it just part of your work? Uh, it's part of my work, but I keep you know over a hundred colonies so uh, of your own for Penn State, yeah. Also, oh, so is it a Penn State apiary or is it Robin's apiary? Or Technically, they own it all. They own it all. They also but, get all the profits from all the honey. <laughs> oh, Penn State makes profits from their honey. How do how do they sell it? Uh, we sell it at the creamery uh, on main campus. And, That's uh, right. They sell ice yeah. cream too, don't they? They do. That we ice cream discuss... is being sold at Northeast at the Straw Hat Chicken Place or something. Straw Hat Ice Cream Shop in Northeast PA. Don't they get Penn State's creamery ice cream? They okay. might, but my honey's not in their ice cream because... Okay. Selling raw honey is easy. Selling honey that goes into food is really hard. Oh, that's There's a whole list of things, a whole list of like, you have to have it tested and this and that. And I'm like, I'm not doing that, but I can put it in a jar and put a lid on it with no seal. And they could sell that. Okay. Now listen, that's an interesting line there. If you're selling the raw honey from your honey house into the jar, that's one thing. And that's easier to do then if it's going to be a component to another finished food product. Yep. And so that's really interesting. And why is that? Just because, I mean, they're, they're both going to be consumed by people. So what are the risks? What's going on there? Do you know? I, it, log, the logic escapes me. Okay. But if people are thinking about, yeah, because if people make honey amended food products, then that might be a different category for selling. That's interesting. Okay, the other thing I want to know about, well, I want to know lots of things, but um, you mentioned the honey through the year. So this year I'm I'm providing my honey sampling. I'm doing weekly samples. And that's for that spotted lanternfly program where we have to scoop honey out of a hive every Thursday or whatever we decide to do. do you, are you yeah. part of that program? I was part of helping to line up beekeepers like you, and okay. uh, I've heard discussion of it. I haven't heard how it's going or anything. Okay. So so you don't know, because I have lots of questions associated with that. Number one, um, well, you helped set up the protocol that we're using. Is that what you're saying? So I do study spotted lanternfly, honeydew honey. Yeah, And so they asked me about doing this particular project after they sampled my suspect honey and were able to um, see that there's lanternfly DNA and also quantify how much is in there. 
Right. So then I think they had a lot of questions about, um, because the Landrefly honeydew honey tastes different depending on the batch. And we think it's probably the proportion of floral versus honeydew mm -hmm. component of it, but knowing how to quantify it, like, I don't know how. And um, also like that honey is made late in the season when the adults are kind of congregating. Um, we're curious to know if they're actually bees are actually collecting honeydew from the nymphs as well throughout the season. And I think, and most importantly, I think the goal of the project is to monitor the landscape and see if there's lanternfly, even if we don't know it. So there's like all those different things wrapped yeah. up in this project. So the way they collect the samples or the way they've told us to collect the samples to scoop those little vials through the uncapped uh, wax. So you end up with wax and honey in it. What if I only got honey and not the the wax? Would that make a difference in the sample quality? I don't think so. I, I imagine they're going to get that wax out of it before they do any. Like, so the wax you just assume because of the way it's collected that it's going to be in there. So for example, if you had flow hives and you just fill the little thing and you're done and it's capped and ready to go. Plus I know that that's fresh. Now, would it matter if it were a high moisture content? Because we're holding on to them, but they ask us to put them in the freezer. That's why they're in the freezer. Because they're uncapped. We have to make sure, yeah, because it has to be fresh from that week. And so it's and not likely fermented. high moisture. That just clicked for me. I didn't understand why I was putting this stuff in the freezer. Now I get it. So I'm glad we're talking. This is this is going to help me. <laughs> so, and so will they be able to tell when they get the honey samples? Because we date them and we have our apiary number and all that stuff. Um, Will they be able to tell the source, like the floral source as well? Or are they just specifically looking for the spotted lantern fly honeydew? Um, they are the same people that can test for that. So, but I don't know if it's part of their protocol or not. Mm -hmm. uh, they're different tests. So that would be a great question for Michelle. Okay. And then... Let's say we've like where I live, we don't have a lot of spotted lantern flies out here yet, but I was very troubled by the tree species that I see that they go after, including the maple and the black walnut trees, which I have a bunch of. Last thing I want are lantern flies on that thing. And I looked at the traps and stuff, but what what do you know about, if anything, uh, the progress in making traps or having a protocol for going after those things? The nymphs, for example. What I mean, are there birds that eat them? What what can we do? Uh, I feel like there's not a lot you can do. Um, if you have large trees and they're abundant, um, it's almost out of your power to do something. I personally have a single maple tree in my front yard, which I watch and I get every lanternfly I can reach in the fall, like every afternoon. I'll just go out and like, because they're really dumb. You can like, just pick them off the tree basically mm -hmm. um and then i scrape the egg masses off that one tree but if you have a woodlot or something i mean it's going to be beyond you to control them there's not there's not a spray um i know they were looking into some biologicals like some fungus i don't know where that went um but i also don't think it's going to kill your trees okay so i don't know how much you need to worry so Unless it just takes like them a little little bit anemic, kind of, just takes some of their resources? But... Yeah, I mean, they would have to feed really heavily year after year. Um, I do know they sometimes do kill Tree of Heaven, but that's um, that's not a desirable tree. Now, anyway. Tree of Heaven looks a lot like sumac. So, yeah. like, we have the staghorn sumac, which my bees really work. And someone made a comment when I showed some of my landscape and said, oh, you've got tree of heaven. And they said, you have to eradicate all of them. I said, no, if you look at the leaves, you know, the serrated edges on the leaves show that that's staghorn sumac. It's not. Um, why tree of heaven and not sumac species like that, if they're so similar? Well, they might look similar to us, but they're not to an insect right. that's, you know, their tree of heaven is from Asia, which okay. is where the lanternflies are from. Um, one thing I do know about lanternflies is that they really like um, like a high pressure phloem. 
Okay. So even among Tree of Heavens, they're going to pick the one that's like the fire hose shooting into their mouth kind of thing. Okay, um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, um, but that's something that they've figured out. Because um, they always wanted, they're like, why are you picking that tree and not that tree? It's right next yeah. to it. So um, now. And they all. Yeah. When they pupate, where do they, they're in the soil? They do not pupate. Oh, what do they do? So they have they lay they have egg nymphs. masses. So okay, egg nymph, 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 adult. So okay, and um, where, how high on the tree would the nymphs be when they first emerge? I mean, they lay their egg masses all the way up. Oh, they um, do. So chickens wouldn't help. Nah. I mean, they might have to come down before they go to another tree. Yeah, because they they can't fly yet. Right. So maybe chickens are a good help? Perhaps. <laughs> chickens, maybe. Okay. <laughs> is there anything that we could, are there any like wild birds, you know, is is there some birds, are woodpeckers going after them? Do they ignore them? Do they, is there something about the spotted lanternfly that makes it not palatable to birds? What's, what's up with them? Um, they do have warning colors, so their underwings are red. So when they open mm -hmm. their wings to glide, it's a flash of red. And the adults are yellow along the sides of their abdomen. So a female full of eggs looks really, you know, fat and yellow. And um, they do take some chemicals from trees and make themselves a bit bitter. Mm -hmm. So there's a paper out about birds, you know, spitting them out. But oh, really? not all birds do that. And some insects will eat them, like wheel bugs and praying mantises and stuff have been seen eating them. It's just such a small number that... Yeah, they can't really impact them. So their reproductive rate is so high that they could almost feed those those species and then still sustain themselves at the same time. Yep. Okay, did you... When you were studying entomology, did you study spiders at all? No, because they have eight legs. I only studied things with six legs. Does entomology not include arachnids too? Is it only insects? Yeah, technically, only insects. So if people study arachnids, what's that called? Arachnologist. <laughs> okay, that does it. Don't ask me about spiders. I was going to ask you about the bolt jumping spider, and now I can't. That was that was half of my interview. Okay, I'm just. <laughs> we could talk about bees. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're going to get to the bees, but I just, you know, I have other questions and it's basically Okay, all... what else? Okay, so moving on. Uh, okay. We can talk about bees because there might be somebody watching that thinks that backyard beekeeping is important. And uh, some of the things that you spoke about, and this was interesting to me at the conference, uh, you made comparisons about the natural beekeepers and those who treated and had integrated pest management. And then I think synthetics were also part of it, but... I wanted to go back. Some of the lowest performing colonies or the highest loss through winter was with the treatment free kind of natural beekeeping community. And is that the state of Pennsylvania or is that a North America? What was the range of the people that contributed that data? Oh, that was all us. We had our we managed our own colonies for that study. OK. Oh, that's right. You put them in like three different geo zones, right? Four. There was West Virginia and then three different spot sections of Pennsylvania. Yep. Okay. So, so that didn't have anything to do with like analysis from the Be Informed Partnership and things like that. No, we did we did use Be Informed data for a study of beekeepers, mm -hmm. but they were not giving us the lost data. We were just studying okay. like management practices of people who identified with these certain like groups of management type so conventional organic or all natural <clears throat> and there was something in your background about formic acid studies do you did research on that specifically <laughs> yes that right? uh, my phd was studying the use of formic acid indoors in winter to try to treat colonies that were already kind of all together in a room um so yeah so indoors in winter so that that would not be a time when we would be 
outside, you know, we would have at wintertime, it would be below the threshold temperature, right? So it wouldn't be volatile enough or something. Right. Uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I was, uh, um, about half the beekeepers would keep their bees in what they called an overwintering building. And the other yeah. half would do outdoors, but they wouldn't just be like Charlie's apiary there. They would be they call them four packs. So like a pallet with four all yeah. with their sides yeah. touching and wrapped and wrapped and, and whatever. So indoors was just an alternative. Um, so how was the they, formic delivered to the bees? So the building itself is maintained at about 50 degrees. Um, and there's this air handling system because you have to get the CO2 out and um, the humidity and stuff. So you would air, there was no, heating no i'm sorry there was no cooling only heating right so it, it had to be cold enough to put them in consistently and then um they would if you bring in cold air it gets very dry and you heat it up and then distribute it to the room i don't know and so we would literally just put like a pan of acid by the fan and when it was blowing air in oh. and through it would go and so we had to we I felt like an engineer, like half of it was like figuring out what percent in water you had to put into the pan. Like there was a low dose and a medium dose and a high dose and mm -hmm. um, how long should you do it, you know? And right. then I was measuring the acid in the air of the room versus inside of the hive. I let, let me tell you, it did not want to go in. <laughs> so that was very interesting. I don't know what dynamic is happening there that is the air from the room is not really going into the hive readily. Huh. Um, so in some way where maybe the bees reducing their air circulation to prevent that from coming in or something like that, were there like airflow tests, uh, like an tiny anemometers in front of the entrances to see input output? No. I mean, I was really the first one doing this. So we were just, okay. it was like the first information about, um, First of all, how do you make that happen? Like you asked, and then yeah. what kind of dose do you need to kill mites? So I had lots of, um, it wasn't a sticky board because it wasn't sticky. It was just like poster board that I would put in the entrance and then I could pull it out and count the mites falling and, and mm -hmm. you know, be death rates and look for the queen on the bottom board and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, it was very lonely. <laughs> yeah. So what was like, the what was the final, dark. yeah what's the final result I mean uh, did it work does it yeah. have potential what it it worked people I guess after I left started actually using it because there's a YouTuber um, Ian Stepler do you know him I know of him yeah because I've he, spoken he, to him. he manages his bees inside a big climate controlled building like that and he's had devastating losses. Um, I wonder if that is that by the way is that an approved even method up there was that part of an experiment like a permit for experimental evaluation or is that something someone like him could actually implement i think that he could implement it i do know that beekeepers are doing it but that doesn't actually mean that it's legal you know how it is in beekeeping <laughs> doesn't mean it's legal okay. i would tell I'm sure Ian talks to my PhD supervisor, Rob Curry, regularly. Okay. So I'm sure that if he was interested, that Rob could help him. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it sounds promising when you control the environment completely and you also control uh, the composition of the air the bees are exposed to, as well as the temperature, humidity, and things like that. I could see that as almost, that's a lab environment. So, I mean, right? Yeah, after after I left, some other people started looking at carbon dioxide and allowing it to get high to kill the mites. Right. And I think there's been some success with that right. as well. Yeah, and that's like high CO2 levels and uh, even the humidity had an impact on mite reproduction levels, right? So that was probably not part of your study though. No, I just did formic acid. And by the way, I also looked at tracheal mites. There were tracheal mites back then. Oh, that's not <laughs> good. I mean, there probably still are tracheal mites, but I stopped. I did that whole thing where you pull their head off and all that. And we um, look for the tracheal mites uh, in their thorax. And uh, I stopped finding any. It was like such a waste of time. 
what is the status mm -hmm. of the tracheomite? What do we know? Is it is it just at such a low level that they're not impacting the bees? Or are they impacting the bees and we're just forgotten to check? Like I we're still so focused uh, on the Yeah. Well, I think varroa mite treatments um, definitely control tracheal mites. Oh, they so do. There's that. Okay. Because yeah. mm -hmm. they were saying tracheal mite uh, treatment is a grease patty. You know, that was well, like formic acid works. I can tell you that <laughs> formic works on tracheal mites. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, if we're talking to consumers, backyard people who want to know, hey, how can I use formic acid? Are you recommending formic pro? Might away quick strips. What are we talking about? What's your preference? I think they're both fine. I think that might away quick strips are more effective. Um, I'm a big proponent of two strips, not one, because that's how you get the mites under the cappings, and that's the biggest benefit of formic acid. I think people need to be very careful and read the instructions like don't take off the paper wear gloves okay so we're talking about the quick they strips both, or formic pro both both they're both the so same because of, but it was the formic pro that you were suggesting the two packs instead of the one after the other treatment for either one either one oh, for either one okay mm -hmm. so instead of the extended the only... treatment period hit them with that double load the single treatment double load right but Watch your temperatures, don't right. take off the paper. Um, a lot of people have suggested, and I don't have research to back this up, that if you're in a double deep situation that you should make sure the queen is in the second box and the pads go between, because it kind of falls. So if you can okay. keep her above it, you have better luck. I, I put the formic pads in the middle and I don't look for the queen and I really don't see a lot of queen death. What I do see though, is that open brood does get killed. Right. So it somebody might feel like the queen is gone because they don't see eggs, but they're just kind of looking too soon. And I promise you that, you know, when she gets back to laying and it they will explode. Like there's going to be such a benefit of the treatment that it's like a fresh start. That's my opinion. Is that your preferred approach to varroa destructor mite management? I would say I prefer formic. Yes. Okay. And you say they're equal pads or strips? Yeah. Or strips are preferred. I think Might Away gives you uh, a bit of a bigger bang. And so if that scares you, then you should use Formic Pro. Okay. It scares you why? Because some people do get alarmed when they see a bunch of dead bees in front of their hive right after they treat. So it mm -hmm. can only work on the strongest colonies because uh, they have to sustain those losses, right? Including the brood that you described. So we wouldn't treat a tiny, uh, like a freshly hived swarm or a nuke or something no like, no 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 oh. okay because these are things that it people don't uh under you're right they don't read all the instructions for starters i think a lot of people watch a youtube and then they go do what they saw and darn those youtubers <laughs> darn those youtube people but uh that's what that's about people like me talk to people like you so that we can deliver better information so Excellent. there were some things that uh, you also talked about. You said um, ways like one of the ways for splitting a colony, for example, I caught the tail end of it. So I wanted to ask tonight, um, you said like walk away splits, not recommended. Is that what you, did you say that? Or is that, did I hear it wrong? Because walk away splits didn't have good uh, like survival rate or didn't have good requeening. Yeah. My my queening, my queen education is always changing. Um, so when we did that project, we did walk away splits, mm -hmm. and by that, I did. Okay, is a walk away split a very specific thing where you take the top box and move it from the bottom box, or is it you took out a nuke and walked away with that and left the queenless colony to requeen itself? Because that's what I was doing. Okay. When they were going to swarm, um, I took away the queen and brood and made a split. And mm -hmm. I left behind the colony that was already trying to make a new queen to make their own new queen. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's not a walkaway split because they're not making any, an emergency queen. 
right? They okay, were already so in you're swarm leaving. mode. Swarm queen. So I'm getting all into semantics. Sorry, okay. No, that's an important <laughs> distinction because when you said it, I was like, what? That's how I do all my splits. <laughs> I, I would walk away splits or what I would, but I, I'm glad you made the clarification. We're not forcing them. We're not just leaving them with eggs and saying, now make a queen. We're saying, oh, you guys are already making queen cells. I'm going to take your queen and some brood and some nurse bees. I'm going to make a nuke over here because she's on her way out anyway. And they already have these uh, swarm cells in progress, which are much larger, healthier. They were planned, right? So that's not an emergency replacement. So you're saying right. you don't recommend forcing them to create from an egg or a recently hatched larva. We're we're leaving them with queens, queen cells. Right. I think okay. emergency queens are the worst queens. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, because so, they're warm queens are great. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's a good distinction because when I heard you say that, I thought, what? That I do that all the time. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but I don't remember saying that. But I, one thing I have described to people is that we had poor like mating success, right? So it's one thing to make the best queen, but then she also has to go off and mate, return, right, and start laying. And so when we did those splits, I would say at least 30% of them did not result in a laying queen. Right. Mm -hmm. So I lost colonies because of something, failure to mate, return to the wrong mm -hmm. hive. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And because I did bad beekeeping, I was only going every two weeks very rigidly. And so I wasn't there to catch that mm -hmm. and fix it in time. Mm -hmm. So any a beekeeper who's going to do a split like that and have those queen cells you have to check back and make sure that they're not getting to the danger zone of like 30 plus days queenless. Cause that's when laying workers happen. Right. right. So yeah. being less rigid, like a, don't be like a scientist, be like a beekeeper. <laughs> so that I think result. And plus like a couple of my apiaries were really managed by a graduate student who was still pretty new to beekeeping. So she didn't mm -hmm. even think to like try to fix it. She just like took notes and then, mm -hmm. It was like too late to fix, but requeening is a risky business, mm -hmm. you know, for a colony. Mm -hmm. So it got me wondering evolutionarily how good of an idea it actually is. <laughs> to requeen? You know, you have, you have a great queen. Why don't you just keep her instead of having her leave? But I, it yeah. could result in these, right? Yeah. It's, um, and so for the back here beekeepers that are watching, uh, one of the things they may be wondering is what should they be looking for uh, to verify whether or not they think the queen returner was mated? Or how do we know when we're que queenless? Is there anything they could even on a cursory level observe that would tell them that uh, it's likely they've lost their queen and didn't get a successful replacement? Sure. The first tip I have for a back here beekeeper is always take notes. So you should know when were you in that colony last and what did you see that time and what was the date? Because <laughs> you're going to forget. Was that last weekend or the weekend before? I don't know. Um, so you need to know a little bit of beekeeping math to understand, you know, oh, I, you, let's say you go in and you have capped queen cells because they swarmed and there's no eggs and no larvae, right? There's just capped brood. That's a different timeline than you know, if there's still larvae or there's no mm -hmm. capped brood left. But let's say they did swarm and you go in and you see there's no brood. Well, for me, there's a sound, right? So a queenless colony that's it's going to roar. But if I see that they're leaving like a sphere of open cells, not just filling everything in with honey. They're like leaving open some space. That's them waiting. They're like, she's going to be here laying any day now. So you should also be patient with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause she's coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's interesting. So they're leaving brood frame cells open rather than filling them with nectar. If there's a pheromone present that indicates that there is a queen that maybe is present, but not yet made it. Like, in other words, there's still something going on where there's hope. 
Is that what I think so. That? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But if you didn't, if they're like overcrowded and full of honey, all bets are off because you they need room to to give them a super and then maybe they'll clear that space for her. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, they can't just be over have nowhere to go with it uh, or they will fill it in. So it's not like a hundred percent, but that's mm -hmm. something I look for. I'm like, oh, let close it, go back next week or five days or whatever. Okay, so now you blew it and you come back and uh, there's laying workers. What's your what's your approach to that? Um, I think the only way to fix that is to add basically a nuke. Um, you can't just throw in a mated queen that will not work. I've wasted money on queens myself. Um, I would say you have to add her and at least two frames of open brood, if mm -hmm. not more, mm -hmm. to be successful. So you're really kind of giving them a pheromone rush when you do that too, that kind of really suppresses those laying workers. Yeah, you got the brood pheromone and the queen pheromone, and then you have some workers who can police those laying worker eggs a little bit. Okay. Um, so you could just stick it down in the middle, or you could do a newspaper combine with mm -hmm. a with a nuke on top. You know, that seems to work also. Mm -hmm. I have tried the shakeout thing with bad results. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm too lazy to go far enough. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Um it's just a, it's it's an super inconvenience to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a it's a hostile thing to do to the hive too. Um, so for people that don't understand, what is the purpose of the shakeout method? What are you hoping to do? People believe that uh, a worker that has developed ovaries is not going to be able to fly back to the hive, or maybe she doesn't know how to orient back to the hive. So they say that it's important for them to not be able to see the hive, like go around the corner or something like that, around a tree or whatever. Um, I don't know if there's any science behind any of that. That's a, but you did try that and it was unsuccessful. <laughs> I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've never done it. People, and I'm glad we're talking about it because people ask me frequently about that method of dealing with. Um, laying workers and that is what people think as you mentioned you know they think it happens but um i much uh prefer what you described with sticking in brood and your replacement queen and kind of overwhelming them with all of a sudden a productive colony and a productive core to the colony and uh, i think that's much less invasive to the bees it doesn't really shake them up so bad literally the shook swarm or shook, whatever that is okay I'm glad we talked yeah, about and I just want to I just want to end that conversation with thank you for using the plural because it's never just one okay laying it's worker. not I have a laying worker right it's laying workers you can have yeah a laying worker situation right but it's never right. just one and there is science behind that <laughs> good because we like science I do <laughs> so show me the data <laughs> yeah yeah I mean that's if you can't repeat it, you know, if it's not repeatable and we have to explain really what's going on. And that's why I'm trying, you know, to make sure if somebody's listening to this or watching, uh, because it's also a podcast, um, we want them to understand kind of what they're looking for and then how to approach it. A lot of people, we had a lot of swarms this year. I don't know what's going on where you were. Did you have a disproportionate number of swarms going on? Or was it's it hard much for me like to know? I mean, I feel like every year is crazy if you just watch Facebook. Um, mm. My apiaries were really calm because I had to take a whole bunch of nukes out for a different project and send them over to Central PA. So my mm. season was calm. But I don't know. I think that it was a great winter. So the bees survived and then they mm. were also strong coming out. So of course right. they swarmed us, what they're supposed to do. Now, that's something that I noticed the bees, when it comes to swarms this year, worse than any other year, um, they're really frustrating me because they're not spending a lot of time in their bivouac spot. They are, I am not kidding. This is, this is, it's hard to annoy me, but this annoys me because there's a certain amount of prep that's involved in going to get a swarm. And I have watched them leave the hive. I watched them go to the tree 
and I have a new piece of equipment I have to test, so it's a gift. 20 minutes later, I'm out there to make a video and get them, and there they go. And this is something that's like they know where they're headed. That, like that bivouac, why did they even bother pausing? Because it wasn't even an hour. Is that something hmm. that, have you heard more of that this year than other years? What's, what's, I, they must have a place they found that was awesome to go to. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know. But I'm used to them hanging out for an hour or two at least. And now we've got a rain event here. So then it's going to warm up this weekend. So if somebody's got colonies that are prepping to swarm, they're probably going to do it on Saturday morning, right? But so I guess <laughs> you, it's going to do it to me because I, yeah. Anyway, whenever I have a wedding to do or something like that, that's when my bees swarm while I'm loading my photo gear in the car. There you go. I, <laughs> have you ever I tried photo, chasing them? <laughs> do I photograph somebody's wedding or do I blow it off and catch a swarm of bees? So... I'm guessing the wedding would be more profitable. Yeah, they'll eat your soul if you don't show up for a wedding. So, <laughs> um, what were you what were you saying? That uh, I don't know. You don't know. Okay, cut. Now, um, what would you like to share with people that are backyard beekeepers? Let's talk about um, a resource that might help backyard beekeepers, like this which came from oh. this, which we're going to talk about. And, and I'm glad that you're here again. And uh, because this was the first one that came out. Was that the first one or was there one before this even? Uh, I think it's the first one, but, you know, that was before my time. Okay. So we're talking about honeybees and their melodies. And this is the current one. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason I want to talk about it is because you had a big part in the revision. And what I'd like to know was the difference between the two of them. Like, what was the most significant revised piece of information in this one that this one did not have? Am I putting you on the spot? No, I mean, I spent, you know, six months back and forth fixing spelling errors and things like that. Um, there were some photos that didn't come out clear. So some photos were replaced. Um, a big part of it is um, the resources section at the end, you know, things change over time. Like, I think the old one had, you know, CDs and DVDs and things like that, that, you know, everything's digital these days. Um, there's also a section about pests that aren't here yet. So I was able to add in. Oh, um, yeah. You've got the tropolalaps mite in here. Tropolalaps and, and then like the giant hive beetle. I don't know if it was in the other one. Um, also, you know, Nozema is now called Virimorpha. Of course um, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. What a great name. It's so memorable. Sorry, no offense to whoever yeah. named it. Um, <laughs> okay. Like, let's... <laughs> it just just a general, you know, refresher update kind of thing. Okay. Um, so is that something that you identified that needed to be done or something they asked you to do? They probably asked me. They've also asked me to do, redo the beekeeping 101 book, which I have been working on for a really long time, but it's a way longer book. And this one, I was like, I think I could bite off this piece and finish it in a reasonable amount of time. So that it felt like a better first thing, you know, to do when I, when I joined extension. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, thanks for reminding me. I haven't been working on that beekeeping 101 as much as I should. Now, is that going to be available to the public also? How do people get that book? Sorry, it's called beekeeping basics the old version which had most of the beekeeping information is totally accurate um it's 10 bucks online um okay. people then, love it i then, just want to update it with and this one's available content. online too yep. ignore, ignore the writing on it i make notes on these things so if people are listening there's going to be a link down in the uh, description and those who are watching on youtube there will be a link down in the video description connecting you to that one also. So 
Yeah. So I think that that you, you didn't even ask me why I care about that book. I think that it's a very important thing for every beekeeper to be able to recognize all the different diseases and pests of honeybees. Um, mm -hmm. It's like your pocket mentor almost, you know, mm -hmm. just so you can have it with you in the apiary in your pocket and figure mm -hmm. out what ailment your bees might have, you know, in an mm -hmm. educated way. Absolutely. And and not just for beginners, for people that have been keeping bees for a very long time, we often see brood conditions and things like that. And the photos in it are really good. And I think that's fantastic, especially for people like me who mentor people. Um, and we don't find these conditions, thank goodness, you know, in your hive. But when we're talking about what we would be looking for, it's very helpful to pull that out of your kit and and show people and compare what the healthy uh, brood area, for example, looks like. What are we dealing with the most right now besides Varroa destructor mite? If we took that off the shelf, what is the biggest challenge for uh, beekeeping? That's such an open question. Um, <laughs> if I think about uh, what the apiary inspectors are dealing with in the Northeast this year, I know that foul brood is actually a really big problem this year. AFB I've, or not AFB. in Pennsylvania that I'm aware of. Um, so EFB or AFB? A. Really? The bad one. Why are they saying it's coming back? Why do they think? Well, uh, my current understanding is well. Early on in the season, I saw a map of Massachusetts, and they were they were finding it all over the place, which is the most concerning part. It's not like it's like one hot spot. And I do believe that they did really good job and traced it back. And there was like a single producer that sold nukes or something that, so that they were able to, you know, trace it that way. What's the name of but, that producer? What's the name of that seller? <laughs> I'm not telling you that. <laughs> um, but it was but, someone in the state of Massachusetts that was um, selling nucleus colonies or something. That, that's the rumor that I heard. So, um, if the if a backyard beekeeper knows no other disease, that's the one they need to know, right? Because okay. you have to get help and you have to call your inspector. It's very, very important right? because it'll affect everyone around you, right? It's just so contagious. Yep, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other problem in beekeeping this year is just swarming, dealing with swarming. Everyone thinks they're queenless and they panic and they buy a queen and then, she, you know, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I think people are reacting too soon. I don't think they're waiting to let the hive recover from a replacement queen. I don't know. I think they just have ants in their pants because okay. as you mentioned earlier on, they go to put a, a new queen in and they kill her. So that's a good indicator that they don't need her, by the way. You don't have to wait for them to kill her. You can even put a queen, just lift the lid and set her on top and see if they feed her or if they start biting at the wire or if they start trying to double up with their abdomens and try to deliver a sting if they're doing all of that they don't need that queen they accept queens almost immediately if if they need one unless they're slaying workers they can be little jerks too so <laughs> yeah so my advice is if you think you need a queen what you should first do is put in a frame of open brood and see what they do with that are they oh, going to yeah. try to make a new queen or not right that's and good. what harm did that do it just gave them some more brood gave a boost which also weakened another colony to do it well, don't that's, take it if they can't stand to lose it. <laughs> well, that's what my that's well, that's what my uh, resource nucleus hives are for. So I can just rob them of anything I want whenever I want it, and they they recover remarkably fast. By the way, so that leads me yep. to another question: What do you think, um, hive design wise? I mean, I like the the concept that if you just learn to take care of bees. Uh, the configuration that they're in is almost secondary if if you understand the biology of the bees and how to care for them and keep them healthy. But uh, is there a hive configuration right now that you prefer? Is it still the standard Langstroth for you? Do you look at horizontal hives? What are you thinking? Um, I don't like horizontal hives for your regular beekeeper because I feel like it's they're real hard to overwinter with the weather all on all sides of them. Um, but I totally get it if somebody is has a physical condition where like they can't bend over or lift or whatever, then yeah, that would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. 
I do think that we could probably make our hives with thicker wood. Wouldn't be a bad thing for the bees, um, mm -hmm. but then they'd be heavier and more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like, I personally use 10 frame equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it's what I learned on, so it's just what feels right to me. Those eight framers seem so skinny and tall. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I am currently experimenting on single versus double deep management. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hear people make claims about the greatness of single brew chamber management, but I don't see the data. Hmm. So I'm collecting that right now. Unfortunately, we had to start because of the nature of the experiment. It's about organic beekeeping on organic farms. So we couldn't use any drawn comb. So this year we had to just start fresh with packages and uh, so we won't have much good data till next year when they have start the season with all the drawn comb because that's pretty critical. Mm -hmm. um, like we got the packages in at the middle of April and now it's the middle of June and like some of them are just getting their second box. So it's like mm -hmm. we're just prepping them for winter the whole year long when you get a package on new equipment. And when you say single brood management, it means you're confining them to a single deep with a queen excluder. Is that what's going on? That's right. And have you not done that before? Or, I mean, is this new for you? Or are you just trying to validate whether or not that is a benefit or not? What? I'm trying to collect the data. So I want to know if you have in the same yard, single or double, um, are they making the same amount of honey? Do they have the same population size of bees? Mm -hmm. um, because what we're really interested in for the project is their foraging and how far they're going from the hive. So we were thinking that if single brood chamber management does result in a smaller bee population, perhaps they don't have to fly as far to get all the food that they need. And so it could be a way of keeping the bees closer to home like in a management type of way mm -hmm. we have zero data yet so i can't tell you anything about it but that's kind of what we're setting up to answer that question how are you tracking their foraging distances so you asked me about um how we're gonna tell how far the bees are going from the hive yeah um and we're going to be putting qr codes on the backs of foragers and then we have engineering uh, collaborators, a couple of students from Penn State and their professor um, that are working on the hardware and software to read those QR codes. Um, they're going to be directional, so you're going to know that it'll be left or returned, and it's using a little computer called a Raspberry Pi hooked to a camera that'll be facing down toward the entrance. So mm -hmm. that's going to result in all kinds of spreadsheets um, with timestamps of to and from the hive, so we'll know how long they're gone. And then we assume the longer they're gone, the farther they've gone. And we're going working with Maggie Cuvion at Virginia Tech, um, who's like uh, does dance language decoding. That's her whole all of her work. Uh, I shouldn't say all because that's too general, but she has many, many papers out about the dance language and what they've learned from studying that um, about what the bees do in the landscape. So there's going to be a graduate student who uses dance language and QR codes and like builds a model to make sure that they're matching, which mm -hmm. should be really cool. So I have a question, maybe you know the answer or not, based on your ability to track these bees and having their QR, QR codes on them. Um, are they foraging in groups? Like are there six or seven foragers that take off at the same time and return at the same time together? Or are they kind of spread out? We'll know that after we get more data. But you don't have any prior knowledge of whether they forage in little groups? Because we make I, I don't. just, um, you know, landing board observations. We'll see a sparse, you know, a smattering of uh, pollen coming in. And then you get these little squadrons where they all have identical, very similar pollen color. And they'll all have roughly the same size uh, collections of pollen on their corbicula, and they all zip in together. 
and it seems like they're foraging in teams. And it would be really interesting. I mean, it probably doesn't, on a practical level, there's no benefit to knowing that other than it's kind of cool to think that they're foraging specific targeted areas in groups. And the other thing is, um, but this is just logging their entrance and exit activity. We don't know where they go or who they're hanging out with inside the hive. No, we don't have plans to collect that information. We also don't know exactly where they're going or what direction or anything like that from the QR codes. Okay. So it's just time. We don't necessarily know distance if they, if there was a lot. Okay. All right. We'll see. This is just the beginning. I right? want to know how far they go. Okay. So what else is interesting that we should know about today? What's going on that, that have you had any aha moments or cool new things that you've observed? Uh, some new data that you didn't expect? Anything? I'm thinking of all things political correct that I shouldn't mention. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I say repeatedly about beekeeping is you need to monitor, monitor for mites and respond when they get too high. I think it's a critical component of beekeeping for the health of the bees and their success for you mm -hmm. um so please at least monitor don't keep your head in the sand you need to do i would say an alcohol wash um we do have some preliminary data about alcohol wash versus sugar roll and it looks like the sugar roll bees don't really live like you think they do it's just a false short life That's after that's Shaking. interesting. So they've sustained enough damage that they just die a couple of days later. Is it just a feel good thing? How did you determine that? Um, we, so it's very scientific. You have to have like multiple treatments. We chilled bees and marked them. And we had one color for, that was their whole entire, that's how we treated them another color where we chilled, marked, and then just put sugar on them. And then we had a third color, chilled, marked, sugar on them, and shaken, and gone through the whole rigmarole of, mm. you know, shake hard, make sure the mites come out, whatever. And then we put them all back in the hive after they, you know, warmed up. And five days later, we went back in and looked for every single marked bee that we could. And there was a drastic decrease in the ones that were shaken with sugar. And we did the sugar alone without shaking just to see, is it like caking up their trachea or something like that? Mm -hmm. It did not seem to be a problem. I think they just got cleaned off by their nest mates and went about their day. But imagine the stress of being shaken in a jar upside down so vigorously. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't really expect a bee to go on with its life as normal. What inspired you to do uh, to do that study? Uh, we were at the American Beekeeping Federation conference the prior year, and it was all virtual because it was a COVID year. Mm -hmm. And over on the little side comments, people were like, "But do they really live? You know, like, and if the scientists don't know, then there's probably not a paper about it yet." Mm -hmm. So we were like, "Let's do that." Because I just want to know, because I really didn't think that the sugar roll was all that. And yeah. we have so some, we don't that, have enough evidence. What? So is that published? Is that a paper that people can read? It's not yet because we wanted to get a larger sample size. Okay, so that's ongoing. Uh huh. Now, what about CO2 for varroa counting? There is a paper about the effects of CO2. I think that they all, it shortens their lifespan as well. So even though they recover and seem normal after we do CO2, we're actually killing them just slower? 
So if I knock out a bunch of bees with CO2, I've actually killed them, even though it's a feel-good moment that they recover and we watch them all go their happy way. They're dying later. Well, they're all going to die eventually. It's well, just so that they die we, a little but, sooner. Yeah, well, <laughs> am I killing bees when I do a CO2? If I'm knocking them out and using that to count varroa mites, am I killing my bees? In other words, have I not saved a thing? I just have a cleaner I, sample because there's no sugar on them and there's nothing <laughs> and, and they're not dead right away. So I just get to feel good. Well, I don't, I don't know that it shortens their lifespan that much. I mean, when I used to do cage studies, I used to blast them with CO2, knock them out and count them into cages and they lived a good two weeks. So. Okay. So I can still feel good about CO2. I think so. Have you counted mites on drones? I have. How'd that go? Actually, be, after I saw Zach Lamas's talk about yeah. that, I was like, yeah. every time I do a workshop, we're going to do, you know, 300 workers and 40 drones. Yeah. And it takes a long time to get 40 drones into a container. So that's not appealing. Um, and I don't think that he gave a threshold yet. Like, we don't know what the numbers mean. Right. But when I talked with Zach, um, we have those queen isolation cages mm -hmm. because he also had that observation where a uh, two to three day old drone uh, attracts mites that are in the dispersal phase and they attach them. They'll leave nurse bees to get on the bodies of young drones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we had this cage with the um, drone brood in it, and then when they emerge from their cells, they're still in the cage and we can hold them until they attract those mites and we pull the whole cage out we don't have to get 40, you know, drones. We have a whole cage full of them. But now I've been telling people we can knock them out with CO2. <laughs> but if that's going to kill them anyway. So, and because oh. there's a lot of, I mean, I like that. And I'm, and so the drones that you collected, which are, we don't even know the age of those, if they're already all over the place. Because he said they fly to other hives at three days. So mm -hmm. we really kind of have to hold those rascals in there. I think we've been missing the boat a little bit based on his research in early spring management of varroa mites. Although I have to admit that uh, I've been trying to do that this year and I'm not finding mites, but then I'm not finding mites on my nurse bees either. So I'm, I'm worried so that- They're all no. reproducing. They're all yeah. in the cells reproducing. Okay, well then thank you for that. And um, <laughs> so- but yeah, or they're on drones and they're in the drone brood. I've got, you know, big colonies that have full frames of drone brood. So um, so let's say you to put your frame of drone brood into one of those isolation cages right. to emerge it so that the mites would be on them. You're yeah. also growing more mites because the drone brood itself, once it was capped, had dropped the mites. Right. So I got a double whammy, though. I get the ones that are even still covered as soon as they start to emerge, because when the queen starts laying... Because we trap the queen on the drone brood. And then when she lays it all up, then we get the queen out and we just have this contained drone brood, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a timeline and we still, they haven't left. So there's no, the mites aren't getting out of the, they might be reproducing in those uh, pupa, right? But they're not going anywhere. In other words, we're waiting for the first group to start emerging. And then when we see the first group emerge, within three days, the whole thing's pulled because we're not even waiting for the rest of them to emerge. I'm getting the first group out, letting them be Faroa magnets, and then we're pulling them all. No one has gotten away. Interesting. I think you need some data. And I'm curious because those drones could be coming out of the cell with mites. What's stopping the mites from going out into the worker brood? Because they prefer the drones over the worker brood, according to Zach. Just saying. I very much respect his work and very glad he did it because it looked like a horrible thing to do. So thank you, Zach. For well, he was making his parents, his parents had to go to Vermont every weekend just to count drones. Anyway. <laughs> um, My parents would never do that for me. <laughs> but I was excited because when I was talking to him the way we're talking right now, I brought out my cage which isn't sitting here, of course. And uh, he hadn't thought of that. 
it would save you all this hunting and pecking. Plus, we know the age of the drones that we're dealing with. So interesting. You know what else would work? Uh, totally different. You know how people do a brood break, right? So yep. all the mites go onto the adult bees. Right. That's what why I have threw, the queen cage. Yeah. What if you threw in the drone frame, perfectly aged to be about to be capped, and all those mites that were phoretic would go into the drone brood and then you take it out of that colony and then you don't have a treatment so now you're natural no chemicals yeah straight ipm i like it what are you suggesting you should try that and let us know how it goes <laughs> oh you're putting it on me okay i see this going. yep <laughs> I, I mean you already have the isolation cage so you could you know, i do you're safe. i'm i'm a one-man band though I can only do so many things. All right. Well, we've been talking for an hour, I think. Let me make sure that I've asked you all the questions I need to know. What would you, oh, what's your favorite uh, bee book? If you had only one, what is it? Who's it by? What's the title? I have to pick Dewey Karen's. Um honeybee biology book because he introduced me to bees and at the time that book was a an in-house spiral bound textbook for my class and now it's like a fancy 80 dollar hardcover book he worked with you on this and i have um i have his book i like that book i think it's a very good choice and uh i think we all need to really understand the anatomy of the bee and and that's a great book and he's a great guy. So that's a very good choice. Okay, now tell us one thing about yourself that uh, people would be impressed by that most people don't know. I have to impress people? I... Something cool, unique, maybe that most people don't know. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that I'm one of five kids. And my mom's first three were a set of triplets that is identical twin boys and a girl. <laughs> but that's not really about me. That's just about my family. Wait, I have a question about them now that we're talking. <laughs> identical triplets? No, identical twin boys identical and a girl twins. that were triplets. That were triplets. Okay. Yeah. So the identical ones. Let's forget the third one. Um, oh. let's, no, I'm going to show her this. Did they... <laughs> have like their own language when they were little like do they have their own like way insider communication stuff like i don't know i wasn't born until five years later so they were already five. Oh, oh you're not making four. observations okay do they have any weird things like where they can feel each other's pain sadness <laughs> like if you kick one of them does the other one yell ouch i'll try that next thanksgiving <laughs> so you don't know okay but I'm they did for... switch places. They switched places at their high school graduation, and apparently no one noticed. Well, they're also one right after the oh. Well, they have the same last name, so they kind of wouldn't they just be next to each other anyway? Yeah, but they switched, you know. Okay. Well, that was fun. Yeah. So <laughs> so does the third one feel left out? Or are they all the same across the board? Oh yeah, totally left out. They call her the door prize. And at family function, she always is like, ooh, triplet picture. And then my little brother and I are like, not a triplet picture over here. But it became really bad when my brothers, like we did 23andMe genetic testing and they actually found out that they were genetically 100%. And now they call themselves twins. Wow. So can you imagine how she feels about that? She's like, no, no, not twins, triplets, triplets. Genetically, so 100%. did you yeah. do? Did you do genetic? Did you do a DNA test for like? Uh, I did. I know people ancestry say ancestry like, or whoever it is. Yep. Yep. And that's how you found out that's not your family. What? <laughs> <laughs> My hair. What was, the most, totally what was the most interesting thing that you learned from that DNA test? Uh, I get made fun of because I have the most proportion of Neanderthal DNA out of my family. <laughs> There's actual Neanderthal DNA in the DNA sampling? 
Is that serious? Yeah, yeah. Is that true? It's so fun. I just have to tell you, so fun. I didn't Some people know that. Like, Never. I guess I gave up all my privacy for the rest of my life because people can I be, have my wait. genome. There's really a genetic link. You there is a link. Then it's not missing. Yep. They have that in the. That's interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't brag about that. I'm so glad you kept that to yourself. So. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Robin, for talking with me and having this interview. <laughs> and I do appreciate it. And I hope that I, I think there's some good practical information for people here. And uh, in closing, I want to remind people these books are extremely good. I get nothing for mentioning this. It's just an excellent resource, as is Dr. Underwood. So, And uh, I hope we get to learn more about uh, some of the research that you're doing. So when papers publish or information comes available, uh, we'll be adding that in the future to the link down in the video description as well. Any closing comment? That's it. Thanks. Thanks for making me laugh. Okay. Well, looks aren't everything. So, okay. <laughs> and that wraps up another episode of interviews with experts. I want to thank Dr. Underwood for all of the great work she's doing at Penn State and for taking the time to do this interview. You'll find all of my interviews at thewaytobe.org. If you like the series, I invite you to like this video. And if you haven't done it already, please subscribe. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this has been The Way to Be.